Welcome to the Mindset Game Podcast. I'm Vered Kogan, and I'm thrilled to introduce our special guest today, Carla McLaren. Carla is an award-winning author, educator, workplace consultant, and social science researcher. Her work revalues even the most, quote, negative emotions and opens startling new pathways into self-awareness, effective communication, and healthy empathy. She is the founder and CEO of Emotion Dynamics Incorporated, and is also the author of several excellent books, like The Power of Emotions at Work, which we're gonna dive into today. We have Embracing Anxiety, uh, The Language of Emotions, and a really awesome workbook called The Dynamic Emotional Integration Workbook. And Carla is also the developer of the online learning site, empathyacademy.org. Really an expert in this world. And I'm so delighted and grateful that you are taking the time to be here with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Verit. It's good to be here. So let's dive right in. What in the world is empathy? We've all heard the word. What, what do you, uh, how do you define it? <laughs> It is so um, difficult. Everyone thinks they know what empathy is, right? It's you being nice to me, but that's not what empathy is. It's, um, and the, the way I've written it about it is it's a, I'm reading, it's a social and emotional skill that helps you feel and understand the emotions, circumstances, intentions, thoughts, and needs of others so that you can offer sensitive, perceptive, and appropriate communication and support. And what that means is empathy is whatever it is at that exact second. It is not, I am being empathic now. It is watching others, flowing with them, understanding their needs, meeting their needs, including doing nothing because it's clear that the person doesn't want anything. So empathy is not always an action. Sometimes it's an, a direct inaction because you read the situation appropriately right it's a very it's a very interactional thing empathy is and there are people who have higher trait empathy than others but empathy is something that you can learn and work on it's a skill throughout your life span so it's not as if there's ever this person is not empathic and this person is uh it's it's basically our capacity to interact with one another and what you mentioned around kind of the fixing it, right? Like the, let me do something to make you feel better. It's something that I hear so often that a lot of people are struggling with, you yeah. know, their spouse, their kid, their employee, team member, you know, like they really just want to help them. And, and so what do you recommend for people who are like, but I want to help? Yeah. Checking in. A lot of times people think I'm being empathic because I'm doing something to make you feel better. And sometimes people need to feel how they feel. Like the most empathic thing to do would be to stop interfering. <laughs> so in our family, we have my husband, Tino, likes to go to solution, right? He likes, he's a solution guy. And so I actually have to tell him, I want to just talk. I don't need a solution yet. And then he can shift into listening mode rather than let me let me solve this with my excellent brain. Um, sometimes I just need to hear what I'm saying. Do you know what I mean? I need to say it to another person and hear what I'm saying before I even know what's going on. And then and then I'll say, okay, now you can go to solution. And then he's like, whew, okay. <laughs> All right, now I'm in my place. But no, he's really good at listening. But I think that's so important is if you feel this urge to help, always check. Are you looking for a kind of a solution from me or do you just need to talk? right? That's empathic. Whereas a lot of people would think that if someone's crying, I need to stop them from crying. Or if someone's having pain, I need to do something to fix that. And the person could be just having that pain and feeling it and figuring out where it is. Do you know what I mean? So we tend to rush in very quickly to try to fix people. And that ends up not being empathic. And I'm curious, is what we're talking about, like being sympathetic or being compassionate? Like, what are the mm -hmm. difference between all of those terms? I move sympathy out of my book, The Art of Empathy, pretty quickly, because if you look at different dictionaries, the, the 
the definitions of sympathy and empathy are switched. And I just went, okay, get out of here. But generally, sympathy is I feel for you, and empathy is I feel with you. And so sympathy can be very distanced, right? It can, it can almost be not that empathic to feel sympathy because you're like, oh, I sympathize, right? And you're not involved. You're not, you're not feeling it. So you're not really there with the person that you're sympathizing with. And it can turn a little troubling if it goes to pity um, because pity is something that I don't want you to feel for me. Do you know what I'm saying? It's rare that I would want to be pitied. So sometimes sympathy can be anti-empathic. Um, and compassion is, you know, we've talked about this a lot. What's the difference between empathy and compassion? And compassion, I make room for in my, I have a model of empathy that has six aspects in it. And compassion's in there, but it's just one of the pieces of empathy. However, many people want compassion instead of empathy. And I call this the compassion camp. And compassion, whereas empathy is you and me feeling together, um, you know, really connecting emotionally and in every other way. Compassion is more me spreading out this sort of concern for others and goodwill over a large, you know, country you know it's like it's it's a very large and very impersonal thing so to have compassion is is empathy per se but it's a piece of it right i can have compassion and have no connection to the person no understanding of what they need or what they're feeling but it's empathy where we get with people and, and some people find empathy too difficult because Empathy is first and foremost an emotional skill, and many people have been trained to see emotions as trouble. So they would say, you don't want empathy, you want compassion, because empathy means you will feel pain, and who wants that? And I'm like, well, I do. If I want to be with human beings, uh, pain is a thing that you would experience, right? And it's okay. Thank you so much, Carla. I, I love the way that you're kind of differentiating between sympathy and empathy and compassion, as you said, which is one of several different uh, components here. If empathy is feeling with someone, I think that that is a really scary proposition for people mm -hmm. um, because it could be very painful if we are ourselves not in harmony, if you will. and you know, really going there with somebody can open up a whole box of things that might be completely unconscious to us or just downright frightening. Mm -hmm. um, and so what do you say to people that are like, I, uh, I just can't do that. It's too painful to be there with somebody. Yeah, I would say listen to that. That would be being empathic with yourself and knowing that you don't have the, the bandwidth at this moment to do it. But empathy is first and foremost, an emotional skill. So to become more empathic, the requirement is to become more comfortable with emotions, to understand them, to know them, to understand their language, and to be able to work with an emotion at sort of many levels of articulation. So soft anger might be, you know, you feel critical, you feel frustrated, medium anger, you're angry, intense anger, you're enraged, you're, you're, you're outraged, that sort of thing, you're incensed. Um, to be able to feel each emotion in its many, um, in its many appearances and its many intensities. Now, many people don't have practices for their emotions. They don't know what to do, right? If an emotion gets high, they're sort of like, I have no idea. I just have to go be alone in a room <laughs> and maybe meditate and hope that this thing goes away because they don't have practices for their emotions. So it's very hard to be empathic in the presence of somebody's emotion that you yourself do not have a practice for. So if someone's feeling anxious or panicky and you got nothing there, your empathy is going to fall away because you are in an area of you know, you're in a foreign country and you don't speak the language. So that's a huge issue with empathy is a lot of times people would like to be empathic, but once it gets down to it, 
they're like, no, I, I would like to wait over here. I'm going to do some compassion. Hold on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Make> compassion. <laughs> I'm going to do compassion for the entire state of California. There you go. Um, but please don't come to me when you're crying because I don't have time for that. <laughs> wow. So brilliant. And what can they do? Learn about the emotions. One of the simplest ways to learn about emotions, and it's so cool. This is from the work of Lisa Feldman Barrett. But just learning more words for emotions will all by itself give you better emotion regulation skills, better emotion, you know, um, awareness, but actually you'll be better to re better regulating your emotions if you simply know more words. So if all you know is I feel bad, I feel cranky, you know, you just have a couple of words, you are not going to be emotionally articulate. And if you can say, I feel a tiny bit critical, but also I feel wistful. You know, like you can, it's not just, I feel mad, sad, bad, glad. Um, you can become more, um, you can become more like a chef of emotions instead of just like, here's a hot dog, stop whining. Um, you can put in spices and you can have cheese, you can have some yogurt, you can have clotted cream, you can do all kinds of things and also stop whining. But <laughs> <laughs> so you can have more of an of a, of a emotional life if you simply have more words for your emotions. And this, is, this comes or it's, it's connected to some a research that was done on native Russian speakers who have many words for blue and native English speakers who don't. And the native Russian speakers could identify more shades of blue than the native English speakers could because they had a word for it. Therefore, they could identify it. And so having more words for emotions means you can identify more emotions. And I think adults can learn to see more blue, right? If they just have better words for it, artists can see more blue than people who don't, you know, who don't work with a hundred different blues that they could choose from. So having those words makes it so that now, at least if you're in the presence of someone, you could say, I think they're feeling some anxiety and panic and grief. What do I know about those? No, probably the best thing that you could say to anyone is, how are you feeling? What do you need? That's like empathy 101. <laughs> It's not like, let me fix you, but ask the person what they need. Yeah. Thank you. And I know that one of the many resources that you offer, I have it here, is this uh, kind of dynamic emotional integration reference guide that has kind of yeah. emotions and some internal questions you can ask yourself and then some actions. So that's it's a cheat sheet. <laughs> it is. Well, right. Of course, there are many resources online. There are apps and so on. Uh, and I agree with you that it is so important to have that language uh, because words have meaning. And when we uh, have that language and, you know, we've kind of built that rapport with that language, meaning we've practiced it enough, we can notice subtle shifts in our energy much more quickly. And we're much mm -hmm. more likely to intuit what other people might be feeling, especially yeah. if we're in a coherent kind of harmonious state ourselves. And so so let's say someone has kind of a broader language of emotions so they mm -hmm. know to recognize let's say their shame or their guilt or their worry or anxiety whatever that might be or happiness joy love what do they do to shift those emotions that that are not uh you know that don't quite feel so good and even before that what can they do to access that the gifts of that emotion emotions have been taught to us as positive and negative, which I think is one of the worst things I've ever heard in my life, because it makes us, it makes us emotionally incompetent at the word go, because if we have an emotion that is classified as negative, we begin to react to the very fact of our human emotion. <laughs> and then if we've been taught that an emotion is positive, we want to run to it. And that emotion's like, why are you here? because this is not time for me, okay? This is not what I do, it's not my job. So one of the things is to understand the emotions jobs. So for instance, anxiety is an emotion that helps you plan for the future and organize yourself. It gives you lots of energy to get your tasks done and meet your deadlines and go. 
a lot of times when people feel anxiety, they try to calm down, which is the exact opposite of what that emotion needs from them. Now, if they were feeling panic, which is an emotion that comes forward to save your life, and there's nothing dangerous right now, that panic is generally coming from a previous trauma that hasn't been resolved yet. So calming yourself down might be good in that situation, but the purpose of that emotion is to help you resolve that previous trauma. So calming yourself down is sort of okay, but it's, it's generally what most people know to do with those two emotions. And in one case, it's emotionally incorrect. In the other, it's like, okay, that's a good start. But many people don't know what the next steps are because they don't understand what the emotions do. Um, happiness is a wonderful emotion that comes forward to tell you things are cool and I'm looking forward to the future. If there's trouble in your life, you don't want to see happiness about it, right? You don't, like, I have what's called a, a, a super high positive outlook. Um, it is a very negative thing in many cases because I'll be like, sure, I can do that, right? Like, yes, give me those 17 things that you aren't finished with and I will finish them because I can, right? That's my happiness. And I've had to like check in i've had like hold on i need to go talk to my other emotions hold on anger what do you think it's like no <laughs> but happiness is my big emotion <laughs> so so when people talk about how do we have more positive emotions i'm like look at me pal it is not a good thing <laughs> look at my house full of things that i agreed to do for other people <laughs> i've gotten better at it but i mean this is the kind of energy that I would go into a relationship that was going to turn out badly, right? Anybody could see it, but I was like, I can just love people. <laughs> I can just fix it because, you know, fairy tales can come true. <laughs> so, so when the so-called negative emotions come up, I listen to them very closely, right? Because now for people who have a, a negative outlook, which is, you can have, you know, anywhere along the, 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 you have a negative to a positive outlook, they might have to focus more on the happiness based emotions, happiness, contentment, and joy, because they are in the, the, the deeper emotions, they are in depression, and they are in sadness and anger and that sort of thing, they, they spend their life there. And so for them, it would be creating a flow so that all of the emotions are, are welcome. Um, yeah, so understanding what emotions are helps you not react to them. So if you've heard, oh, anxiety is terrible, and you feel anxious, you're like, oh my gosh, I have failed at basic human maintenance functions, and <laughs> I need to go and I call the police on my own self because I'm having this unacceptable emotion. <laughs> Right. And so understanding them means that you take away that level of, of uh, you know, self-abuse about the fact that you've had a human emotion. I was, someone was crying yesterday or the day before, and the first thing they did was try to push their tears back up in their eyes and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I just said, are you telling me you're sorry for having a normal human emotion? And then they were able to cry. But it was just so funny that that's one of the first things we do with sadness, which is a beautiful emotion that comes to help us let go of things that aren't working anyway, that these things need to go. And if we don't do our sadness, we're like clogged with all of these things that clearly don't work if we would just listen to our sadness and let it go. Yay, sadness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I did a training um, a couple of days ago uh, for a group of executives on kind of the gifts of emotions. And, you know, we talked about sadness, you know, I, I call her sweet, sweet little sadness, right? Him, her, yeah. right? sweet little sadness. <laughs> Such beautiful gift. And we, and we really cannot be free to kind of go through that change curve, right? That grief curve until yeah. we really accept the sadness, the grief, even if it's a change at work or personally that we welcome, we've got to accept the grief. The body needs to to be with that. 
Um, and, and as you said, a lot of people are not comfortable with that. So they immediately go to, all right, let's, let's focus on the benefits and all the stuff we need to do. I know the happiness is coming in. I was like, this isn't a time for you. Happiness, my friend. <laughs> That's right. If we, if we want it to be a sustainable, positive change, you're right. It's absolutely because otherwise people will go right back to the old pattern because they haven't really completed what needed to be completed. Yeah. And there's something called a toxic positivity bias where people just want to see the upbeat and happy. And uh, well, one person said, um, don't bring me, a, this was a boss, don't bring me a problem unless you have the solution. And I was like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> okay, because if I had a solution, it wouldn't be a problem, would it? But the person didn't want to hear any problems, right? They, and so that whole workplace was struggling because there wasn't any place for people to bring the real situations that they were facing in their life, in their workflow, in their relationships. There was no room for it. And so forget sadness and grief you know like they couldn't feel anything but i've got the power to make choices you know it was really silly it was really silly well let's dive right in then to the power of emotions at work since we kind of seem to be going there because you know a lot of people like believe or they con you know consciously understand that emotions are important at work like people are a little bit more enlightened these days they they recognize that we need resilience yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> depending of course on how enlightened the senior executives uh, are of course yeah. um, and and still to bring that into day-to-day -day practice uh seems to be a challenge yes um, because we tend to be so focused on all the stuff we need to do that we don't create space, a safe space within ourselves or in the lens of a team or you know, a department or organization to really be with the emotions, to mm -hmm. express them in a safe, respectful way, to ask for what we need, to really tune into one another. So what is important for the listeners to know as it relates to the power of emotions at work? I've written a book about how to create a workplace social structure that is supportive for human beings, which sadly most workplaces are not supportive for human beings. We saw in the great resignation, which is still going on, that once people had a choice or once they had been home, they sort of went, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going back to that. I'm not going back. Um, and there was a great deal of hope that they could find a better place somewhere better. And I've talked to a number of young people who left their job to go to a better place. And they were like, this is not better. So they went back to the first one. <laughs> like, at least I know this one. Okay, this one, I have all the problems mapped. But this one is a whole new thing. Um, but because in general, people say, leave your emotions at home, you come here to work. But you can't leave your emotions at home because humans are first and foremost, in emotional beings, right? Emotions underlie all of our thoughts, all of our ideas, all of our actions, all of our behaviors, all of our, we choose our relationships with our emotions, we choose our jobs with our emotions, we vote with our emotions. And so if we don't understand them, and we're in a place where I call most workplaces unintentional communities, because there isn't, um, you know, there, there's like the handbook, the handbook, here's how you do this and here's whatever. But there isn't a thing in most workplaces where people have a reliable stated way to interrupt someone who's busy, which happens every single day. And it starts up whole trouble, you know, like a whole boiling vat of trouble eventually. Um, how to say that you've made a mistake without being shamed or shunned how to suggest that someone else made a mistake without losing your position and going down in flames. <laughs> you know? um, all of these things that have to be done. Oh, which is, if something is really important and I need you to see it now, is this a text, an email, a phone call, or do I come by your desk? Like most workplaces don't even have that as, an, as even a concept. So people have to figure it out themselves. 
So people are using a tremendous amount of empathy at work. They're reading each other. They're seeing how the social structure works. They're figuring out if you want to talk to this person up here, you have got to get in good with this person here at this level because this person has that person's ear, right? And you become like this social structure um, uh, secret spy, right? Because the social structure is not, um, nobody sort of knows what it is. Nobody has said, this is how we do this, right? The way they say it is they give you a look or they shun you or they talk about you or, you know, people just like stop talking when you come in the room and then you realize I've done something wrong, right? So the social, I call, I call workplaces unintentional communities because people are thrown together to do really important things and survive financially. But there are no social structural rules that people can can rely on. So when I go into a workplace, I look at the structure and I look at the emotions that are coming up. And just I can I can just hear from people for maybe 30 minutes and I'm like, boom, I got it because I listen to the emotions, which is where everything happens. Ha. People are like, no, look at our vision statement. I'm like, nope. Your vision statement means nothing. <laughs> that is just like it's icing on the top of a cake that's very, very tall. I'm looking here at what's on the ground. Yeah. 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 And, and I love that because I think it is important to get to kind of the truth of those dynamics mm -hmm. as they are. And, and then once you understand that, then you can... Uh, understand what is the best way to solve. So I'm curious, like, what are some of the biggest gaps that you see? Or, uh, uh, you know, as you said, kind of like, maybe it's missing certain processes and mm -hmm. things. Like, what are some of the biggest challenges that organizations now face with regards to working uh, with the power of emotions? And what can they do to remedy that or to uh, make it easier for people to to be with their emotions? Not understanding social structure is crucial, and many workplaces are hierarchical because that's how it's done, right? There's a, you know, this, the board or the boss, then there's the managers of the people, and then there's this manager and that manager, and like, it's very hierarchical, it's siloed. That is not how humans work best. Uh, egalitarian systems that are more flat and supple, supple networks work better for almost everything except governmental structures which need to be very formalized and bureaucratic um, but as we've all seen with governmental structures if you don't understand the the social fact of a hier hierarchical formalized bureaucracy it can become extremely dysfunctional it can create you know misery if you don't understand why a bureaucracy is what it is. So a lot of people go in and create a structure, a social structure of a workplace without understanding thing one about social structures. They just do what they saw the, the, the thing that they did, right? Most workplaces have uh, horrendously too many managers. The, the entire managerial class could get moved out of most workplace structures, unfortunately. Hopefully we'd have something else for them to do. But uh, another important thing is that we don't have managers of people, we have managers of processes. And you almost never see that. There's always this idea that you've got to make people work, that you've got to give them um, performance reviews, which there's no research anywhere that suggests that performance reviews are good. And most of the research suggests that they're terrible. All performance reviews are, um, are dysfunctional. But they're a part of that whole hierarchical structure of power over people rather than power with people. So that's one of the big problems I see is if you have a hierarchical structure, generally, the emotional rules for the people at the bottom are extremely different than the emotional rules for the people at the top. So everyone has to do this. Everybody like the dogs come in and you have to pick up after your dog and the dog can't bark and blah, blah, blah. But the, the boss comes in and their dog barks, the dog pees on the rug, the dog, do you know what I mean? Like people with power get to break all of the rules. And that is going to create 
um, very necessary emotional destruction, you know, very destructive emotional environment, very destructive empathic environment, simply because the structure is toxic. And so that's hard. I, I talked to somebody who said, well, we're never going to get rid of hierarchies. I'm like, dude, people do it every day. It's not hard. But he was very much in, I've only seen hierarchy. I don't know how to do it any other way. So therefore, hierarchies cannot go away. And yes, they can. Yes, they can. There's another thing that happens in hierarchies, empathically speaking, is there's so much research on this. As people move up, their empathy decreases. Hierarchies are very damaging to empathy as people move up to the top. And it's found that many CEOs, somebody said 50%, this sounds outrageous, are, could be called sociopaths because their empathy is so low. But without understanding the way that hierarchies damage empathy, really, it's, it, it, this is a structural function. It is not a function of, of the person. Just, uh, sociopathy is actually very rare. It's like uh, less than 2% of humans are actually sociopathic. Then how are 50% of CEOs, right? There's something in the structure that is damaging them. And at the bottom, you will also find hyper empathy because the structure itself with the hypo empathy at the top, the social structure has to have hyper empathy at the bottom. So you will have lower level workers burning out um, in droves, right? And they don't know why. Um, uh, Amazon is a really uh, perfect example. It's, I mean, it's a horrific work environment, but Jeff Bezos himself is, you know, strongly unempathic. He's, he's, he's very not empathic. And the burnout and the, um, the what is it, attrition in, in Amazon workers is massive. It is, you know, books have been written about the modern day, you know, kind of um, what, what would it be? It's not slave labor, they are being paid, but just the extensive burnout that occurs at places like that, that are so um, aggressively hierarchical. Um, so looking at structure is really important and something really simple, looking at um, physical comfort. Most businesses are not made for the physical comfort of human beings. If they're spas, then yes, they're made for the client. But if you look at the back, if you look at the backstage of a spa, you will see like dirty, dirty rooms where people are supposed to have their lunch, you know, and they're like cramped little rooms. There's not even a room for the spa workers. It's all outside. And so I do a lot of work in spas, <laughs> right? Because these are just heavy, heavy, heavy empathy workers. You know, when you lay down to have your massage or whatever, usually you're talking, you are letting go of, you're letting go of the, the stresses of the week, right? And there's your massage therapist or your facialist pulling all that up. And then she goes into this nasty little room. She gets five minutes between clients and she burns out, right? So looking at the physical plant, can people relax? Can they take actual real true breaks? Can they rest in this place? And is it quiet? Do they have privacy? The answer is almost 100% never, <laughs> right? So this idea that we love our employees, they're our employees are our most valuable resource. I'm like, then let me show me their break room then, okay? <laughs> You just show me their break room. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of like, because, because if, unless you took the sociology of organizations, you would not know these things. So there's a lot of unconsciousness in the workplace. Like a, like a, you know, a five-year-old child could go in and say, this is a very uncomfortable place to work, dad, you know, but for some reason we all missed it because those are the workplaces that we've grown up and we've gotten used to. Brilliant. I think that those things are so, so, so important. Sometimes it is those little things, you know, the uh, how do you greet people, the where do they go to lunch, the, uh, you know, and you know, it's interesting that you kind of said the, the gap between kind of the top and the 
kind of lower levels in a hierarchical organization because you know what we absolutely do see, do see from research is that kind of people at the quote unquote bottom um you know very accommodating or mm -hmm. avoiding in terms mm -hmm. of like conflict type of uh behaviors and at the top it's very much like about control as you yeah. said and and so in addition to uh like seeing if we can flatten the organization, uh, creating a more nurturing physical environment for mental, emotional, physical well-being. You know, maybe bringing people to, you know, teach you tools for self-regulation or other things like that. What else can a leader who's listening to this podcast do to help himself and the people around him to? Uh, really get the genius, the gift of the emotions that are available mm -hmm. to all of us. Yeah, I think understanding that each emotion has a very specific purpose. It, it arises to help you do very specific things. And to understand each emotion, there's only 17 of them, so it's not hard. Um, but, and of course, there's, you know, a, a hundred permutations of each emotion. But I talk about developing emotionally well-regulated social structures, and I have nine features that people can, can work toward because almost nobody has all nine working at once. But what I've found over the decades is that this is what you see in healthy relationships, this is what you see in healthy families, and it's what you see in healthy social structures of any kind. Um, and most of it is everybody has an emotional vocabulary that people understand what emotions are. And uh, I can just read a couple of them. Uh, mistakes and conflicts are addressed without avoidance, hostility, or blaming. You can be honest about mistakes without being hurt or you know, you're not gonna be endangered. Um, your emotions and sensitivities are noticed and respected and you notice and respect the emotions and sensitivities of others. This is huge in, what I call high empathy demand workplaces like nursing, where the nurses are doing a tremendous amount of empathy work, a tremendous amount of reading the situation, uh, you know, uh, being present for the person, making sure that the person feels the patient is feeling okay. And then sometimes when the nurses go to their break, they unload on each other, which, okay, yeah, but they very rarely ask. So I may come from working with a patient who's very difficult and I'm just like trying to drink some water and someone comes and says, you would not believe what Dr. Wolf just told, right? There's not even a, there's not even a, do you have the emotional and empathic space to listen to me talk about this situation that has occurred? There's not even a question, right? So what we end up having is people who are like multiply dumped on because nobody even understands that that's a thing that, that you should ask people, do you have time to listen to me whine and complain <laughs> about this thing that happened? And I can say to you, I will at three, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Can you hold on to it? Um, because I just had a thing that happened. So at three, I would like to trade with you because like you take four minutes and I'm going to take four minutes, right? So there's a reciprocal situation going on, which is very rarely what people, they don't even know that there should be reciprocity in this kind of stuff. And if you tend to be a very high trait empathy person, you'll be the person that everybody comes to. And you'll go home and you go, I only worked a six hour shift. Why do I feel so tired? <laughs> Because you won't even have an idea that you've been doing emotion work and empathy work and it's unpaid and it's unrecognized and it's unsupported. Um, there's also something that um, you and others feel safe enough and supported enough to speak the truth, even if it might destabilize relationships or processes. This is almost never. It's, it's almost never that, that I could say, you know that thing we spent $400,000 on? it doesn't work at all. You know, like people, businesses go down in flames behind that $400,000 thing that no one will talk about. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, that really cool idea we had of opening, like creating an open plan office and we spent $60,000 on it. It is the worst idea we've ever had. We need to put the walls back up. Nobody, 
<laughs> nobody <laughs> is going to say that, right? And so, so what can leaders do to help that honesty come through? Create it throughout. Create it throughout and model it. Mm -hmm. And model it. That's one of the biggest things a leader can do is say, you know what? I screwed up. And to see that it's okay. There's a wonderful, um, like a, a community called, <clears throat> a, I'm swearing right now, fuck up nights. And you come and you talk about all the things you did that were terrible mistakes. And it starts and it's very, you know, people are just red and they're full of shame. And after about 15 minutes, people are screaming with laughter and falling down because it's so healing to hear that someone else has made a mistake. <laughs> I mean, that could be a great way to start a meeting. To say, I want to talk about something I did wrong this week. It would have to come, especially in a hierarchical workplace, it would have to come from the top. The person at the top would have to have the emotional capacity to speak honestly about what it is to be a human being. Yeah, and, and rewinding the clock even more for those people who are parents or you know, grandparents, you know, it starts in the home, right? Kids are coming home and saying, hey, what mistakes did you make today, right? And, and what did you learn from them? Yeah, and or if the mistakes aren't quite good enough, you say, I, would, I need you to fail harder next time because that wasn't a good enough failure. Like, like oh, what is it? Michael Mead, the mythologist said that um, we, our job is to be vanquished by larger and larger foes. And I love that because it just makes you like, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for it. Like it's a game of Red Rover. I'm just going to do it. And people very rarely have that kind of freedom. You know, it's like, I have to do it exactly right. Or I'm going to be fired. And in many places, that's true. You will be fired. You will be fired for making mistakes. Wow. Well, you know, um, you, you mentioned briefly earlier kind of empathy work and, you know, emotions work, mm -hmm. emotion work. What, what do you exactly mean by the difference between the two? There's the three terms, two from the sociologist Arlie Hochschild. Um, one is emotional labor. And she writes about that in a famous book called The Managed Heart. Emotional labor is any work that you do to manage your own emotions or the emotions of others in the context of your job. So if you are in um, like a public facing thing and someone comes in as it's just being a jerk in your regular life, you could leave or you could just stare them down or you could say up yours, pal. But in the context of this public facing work, you've got to manage your emotions. You've got to do emotional labor to say, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. I'm so sorry. What can I do to help you? Right. So that's emotional labor. It is very rarely identified. It is very rarely supported. It is very rarely paid. It is considered something that you already know how to do when you came into the workplace. Sometimes they train you a little bit on de-escalation techniques, but mostly it's, it's an, uh, sort of an unknown secret world, emotional labor. But it's like repressing, right? Because if you're not really dealing with what's going on inside of you, or at least listening to those little voices, you're just putting it away and putting it away and putting it away. Yeah. And you might be putting something on top of it, like uh, empathy, you know, like a concern for others or compassion. You're, so you're putting that on top of your emotions. And that's a big thing to ask someone to do, right? And usually there's no awareness or consciousness about it at all. And so there's a big burnout place and people won't even know why they burnt out. They know they don't like their job. They know they're sick and tired of customers. And one of the things that, I, you know, people say, how do I know how empathic I am? How do I know if I'm an empath? I said, if you've ever been unkind to a, a customer service representative, you are not an empath. Goodbye. <laughs> if you've ever taken off after someone in the workplace, I'm like, nope, no empathy there. <laughs> Um, the next thing is called emotion work and emotion work is any work that we do in our lives. It's not paid specifically. So the difference between emotion work and emotion labor is that you get paid for the labor. Not very well, usually. Um, and then I created a term called empathy work. 
which is a kind of a larger you're reading social structure, you're reading these relationships and those relationships, you're reading the hierarchy, you're reading the whole thing so that you can figure out exactly how to, to do this thing. You're reading groups. So empathy work is a kind of a larger, like a sociological kind of work. And it is also not paid for. It is also not supported. It is also not recognized. And it's some of the most important work we do. Um, you see a lot of places where a worker isn't a good fit. It is often because their emotional labor and emotion work and empathy work is not, it's, it's just not, you know, jibing with the others. It's, there's, they have a hard time figuring out the social structure. And so their social behavior may just feel really out of place. And no one has any language to talk about it, except they're not a good fit. Yeah. Thank you. You know, one quick point around kind of the great resignation, if you will, or mm -hmm. this kind of issue where there are a lot of people, you know, are saying, I'm, I'm done with this, right? Yeah. And then they go and sometimes, you know, realize it's not, you know, the grass isn't greener, <laughs> the other lot, right? So they come back. And, and it's like, what I'm learning is that if they have not done the work, to really tune into their own emotions, the gifts, the voices on the inside that often are uh, there from early trauma, then they're kind of just taking all of that and plopping it onto wherever they go. Mm -hmm. And they kind of project that out and then they kind of see more evidence of that at the new workplace. Um, and as you said, sometimes the, the, the evil, so to speak, that we know is better than what we don't know. Um, so what if anything resonates there for you and your work? What I notice is that workplaces are, because they're social structures, they tend to draw to them the exact people that the structure requires. So I talk about keystones and the power of emotions at work. And if you, if you remember from, from building, a keystone is a really important top piece that comes at the end of building an arch. So you build the arch from both sides and then you come up to the top and you drop the keystone in and it makes the arch strong. I call workers keystones if they exist to um, address problems in the social structure. A lot of times a keystone will be what I call an agitator. This will be the person who's always angry or always there. I look at it as a family and you know the the idea of the identified patient. A lot of times people will have me come in to look at a problem employee. It is almost never the employee that's the problem. They're responding to the social structure. And a lot of times they're having an emotion that is not allowed in the social structure. So something about the structure, I'm not saying in a structure is a living thing, but it sort of is. It's an entity. The structure sees that person and says, let's hire that person. <laughs> Something, something in our, you know, unspoken, unsupported, unaware, empathic selves. See, that person is going to be able to live out the anger that none of us are allowed to have. Let's bring them in. And then we blame them for having the emotions that the structure doesn't allow. Or we have people who are what I call ambassadors. They invite people in and teach them the social structure because nobody else does. It's not anywhere in the manual. Or there's people who are peacemakers, like between um, between R and D and shipping, there is fighting, just constant fighting, and they don't even have the same understanding. And there's just one person who goes between R and D and shipping, and keeps it smooth, right? And if you move that person out, the whole business is going to fall apart because they came in after, like R and D was built over here, and then shipping is over here, and there's this keystone that came in at the end so yeah a lot of times people want me to talk about a problem employee I was like let's look at the problem let's look at the structure let's look at your break room let's look at how much break time they get let's look at it do they get privacy I like I, I rarely focus on individuals sometimes yeah the person is just a jerk and they need to go but so rarely is that true <laughs> This is so <laughs> fascinating, really. I think we could sit all day yeah. and just kind of talk about this because it's real. 
Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, oftentimes we just don't get to have those real conversations, um, yeah. you know, with ourselves, with our teams to get what is the actual root cause and the yeah. real problem. So we're not solving a not problem and just hiring out another problem, you know, future problem employee, right? Because that's yeah. what we're making them. So how can people learn more about this? I mean, more about how to label their emotions, more about how to embrace anxiety, you know, do all that emotional integration work. There's a lot of free stuff on my website at carlamclaren.com. And we also have one or more courses every month at empathyacademy.org. So you can come just learn about all 17 emotions or a specific one or or different doing art with your emotions. It's very fun. I have a lot of um, interesting instructors on there and everybody's doing something very different. It's very, it's very lively at Empathy Academy. So cool. Well, I am so deeply grateful for everything that you shared today. I mean, it was so cool to learn from somebody like you that has actually had those conversations that knows so deeply you know, the absolute genius and, and love and gifts that we can get when we are willing to go inward and be with our own emotions and yeah. listen to the voice of what they are wanting us to know so we can take even better care of ourselves and then, of course, of others. So mm -hmm. once again, thank you. Thank you so much.